G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Native a huge shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, sometimes it rains on your birthday, sometimes the line for coffee wraps around the building, sometimes gas goes up 10 cents, sometimes life stinks. The good news, you don't have to, because Native has your back. Native cares about the products that you put on your body, they're about stopping the stink, the right way, but that's the Native difference. You probably already know about Native's legendary aluminum-free deodorant, but have you tried their body wash, toothpaste, or their brand new mineral-based sunscreen? Yeah, Native now has a broad-spectrum SPF 30 sunscreen for your face and body. It's lightweight, absorbs quickly, and you can choose between unscented or coconut and pineapple. Native's on a mission to overhaul your entire hygiene routine by putting the care in self-care, with products carefully made to work against odour that are made with simple ingredients and smell great. You can get their deodorant and body wash in amazing scents like coconut and vanilla, citrus and herbal musk, lavender and rose, and more. You can even build your own personalised product bundles. Mix and match three of your favourite scents and keep them on rotation so you have something for every occasion. So stay fresh, stay clean with Native by going to nativedeo.com slash scared or use promo code scared at the checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash scared or use promo code scared at the checkout for 20% off your first order. In late May, I decided to take a trip to London for a long weekend, and I stayed at an Airbnb for the first time. It was a nice detached house, slightly away from the usual hustle and bustle of busy London roads. And the first day was, well, all well and good. In the morning, I left to explore the city, and when I came back to the Airbnb, I found it weird how the entry lights were on, as I'm vigilant with turning off lights when leaving. It's almost like a muscle memory nowadays, wherever I am. However, I was a bit tipsy that night and decided to just put that thought to the back of my mind and I went to bed. So the next morning I got up and I left to do some more exploring. I came back home in the late evening and when I stepped through the door, the front lights weren't on this time. But what I did find strange was how the window near the front door had its blinds drawn to the side when they were previously closed for as long as I had been staying there. As I made my way to the kitchen, I came in to find a half full glass of cola on the countertop alongside a dirty dish in the sink. Now, you may think that it was mine and maybe I just forgot. However, I know that I had cleaned up after cooking breakfast that day and the remainder of what was in that bowl looked like cereal, which I didn't have that morning. I wasn't planning on making excuses though, and I trust my instincts, so I promptly left the premise and I contacted my host. He came down rather quickly as I hung around the closest bus stop. When he got there, we went in together, and I told him that I was concerned that someone had gotten in when I was away or something. He was thankfully very empathetic and understanding of my concerns. He then decided to remotely check the camera footage, and whilst rewinding, he caught a man wearing a backpack entering through the back bathroom window through the garden, then leaving about two hours later through the front entry window, which when we checked, was still unlocked. Remember how I said that it was odd that the blinds were drawn back on that window? Police were called and we both filled in our statements and from what I know, he has since taken that property down from his Airbnb page and it's not been back on since. I've not been contacted by the police after the initial report either so honestly I can't even tell if he's been caught or not or if the host had any further footage of this man coming in and out. I'm just really glad that I didn't come face to face with this guy because who knows what would have happened. This is a, a bit of a long one, so strap in. So, I've always been a bit of a skeptic, I guess, when it comes to the paranormal and stuff like that. My family is religious, don't get me wrong, and believes in spirits and demons, and I do as well, but I never exactly bought into any of the actual stories of entities inhabiting houses and stuff like that. Now, how 
However, I'm not so skeptical anymore. If anything, I'm downright terrified because I still have no idea what really happened. My boyfriend came over last night to watch a movie and chill. Nothing out of the ordinary. I'm currently dog sitting for some neighbors down the street. Nothing big. I've done it quite a few times for them before, so I know the routine and everything. I never really felt nervous at night or anything, so everything was normal. At around 10pm though, my boyfriend and I left the house to go walk the dog. It was dark out and we were just chatting as we went down the street. But we approached the driveway and I just got this really weird feeling in my stomach. But I chalked it up to being a stomach cramp and just continued up the driveway. I opened the garage door and walked inside. And as I'm walking in, my boyfriend just stopped dead in his tracks in the middle of the garage. I kind of assumed that he just didn't want to go in since it's an unfamiliar house and all, so I continued on. There's these sort of two-layered doors leading into the house, a big wooden one followed by a glass door, and I opened the wooden door and instantly just got this weird feeling in my gut. Let me preface this too by saying that I personally am not a fan of the dark and prefer to keep the lights on, especially when I'm alone in somebody else's house. And for this exact reason, I always made sure to keep a few lights on in the house, for when I went to dog sit at night, that is. As I opened the glass door, though, I quickly realized that every single light in the house was now off. The only sliver of light that I could see was coming from the closed bathroom door. I murmured something about it to my boyfriend, who also noticed the bathroom light and was still standing in the garage. I finally stepped inside the house and instantly faltered. The atmosphere was just, and I know this is going to sound weird to some people, but just so oppressive. I felt extremely vulnerable and exposed the second that I walked in there. Now, the dog's kennel and food is directly to the left of the door, so I turned to go take her out. As I was getting ready to open her kennel door, I just got this inexplainable urge to look behind me. Turning around, I stared directly into the empty and dark living room. My heart just instantly stopped. I felt waves of nausea and fear started to wash over me. It was like something was just staring right back at me from within the darkness. The raw primal fear was something that I've never felt before. It felt as if whatever it was was watching me from there and just waiting for the chance to hurt me. Every instinct in my body was screaming at me to just run and just get out of there. But my boyfriend was saying things to me from the doorway, but I genuinely couldn't understand him because I was just too scared to take anything in, I guess. Eventually, I finally turned to look at my boyfriend, who stared straight back at me and whispered that we needed to go right then and there. He looked like he was about to throw up, and I could tell from the look on his face that he was feeling the exact same fear that I was. I quickly opened the kennel as fast as I could, grabbed the dog, and we just bolted. I was instinctively tearing up as we left the garage from pure fear as well, and I could tell my boyfriend was too. We waited until we were at the entrance of the driveway to even risk talking. Eventually, when we did start talking, my boyfriend told me how he felt like something was horribly wrong in that house, and that he'd felt as if he was about to vomit from fear and nausea, I got even more freaked out hearing him describe the same symptoms that I felt. If I'd been the only one to experience this, I probably would have chalked it up to simple fear of the dark reaction, but hearing his words just made it so much worse. At first I was assuming that this was a part of a home invasion, convinced that someone was waiting in the dark with a gun. I contacted the owner of the house who confirmed that they owned automatic lights, but they shouldn't have all gone off like that. Truly wonderful words to ease my fears, right? I then called my mom, who was still at our house, telling her what happened as we walked the dog down the street. My boyfriend was attempting to calm himself down as I talked, and I think we were both just super shaken up at this point. It honestly felt like we had escaped a near-death experience. After some persuasion, though, she agreed to go back to the house with us to help us check everything out, but it was clear that she didn't exactly believe us. To be honest though, I didn't care. I just wanted to have an extra person with me in case of a home intruder or something. 
See, I didn't really think it could have been anything paranormal at that point. I was just terrified that there was someone in that house with a weapon. She walked with us back to the house and we explained the terror that we'd felt inside the house and our gut feeling to instantly book it. We approached and walked up the driveway cautiously, carefully looking for any signs of break-in and as we finally approached the garage door, however, the dog just started going absolutely crazy, like wild, snarling and growling at the garage door like something was on the other side. And the fear and the nausea came back in full force to the point where I just couldn't stop crying. The tears were just coming down my face and the closer that I got to the garage door, the worse it felt. I practically begged my mum to back up from the garage door and she just seemed pretty concerned at this point and contacted the owner again as the dog continued to growl. After a quick conversation, we all eventually decided to open the garage with bated breath. And when we did, nobody was inside. Walking into the house now, I felt the terrifying presence fade a bit, but the atmosphere was still just really eerie and unsettling. We turned the lights on and after a few moments of tense silence sort of relaxed, the dog ran to a food bowl and all seemed to be calm. And then my boyfriend pointed out that the bathroom light, which had previously been on, was off. The door was also cracked slightly open. We sort of nervously laughed about it and after the dog finished eating, I went to put her back in her kennel. The door to the kennel, though, was now let shut. And I knew that I hadn't shut it when we left, and just pushing it closed wouldn't have been enough to completely latch it shut. It's one of those dog kennel doors that you need to push the latch into sort of two directions to properly close it. That cold chill came back to me then, and I shared a worried glance with my boyfriend. My mom then abruptly stood up and announced that it was time for us to leave. We all walked to the back of the house in relative silence and my boyfriend and I just kind of cuddled for the rest of the night. He mentioned that he felt like the experience was supernatural or paranormal and to be honest, I agreed with him. I mean, there were no signs of a robber or anything. It definitely felt like some kind of malicious entity, but I don't know, maybe it wasn't. Everything that happened was just so surreal and I'm not even sure anymore. I get chills just thinking about it though and I guess I'm just wondering if anyone has had an experience like this before. Could it have been some sort of a, a demon or something? Or do you think it was a break-in or something? Any advice or shared experiences would be helpful as I really just cannot find much online. Thank you. I grew up in an eight-bedroom farmhouse with my dad until I grew up and moved out. But we always had extra rooms not being used, and because of the age of the house plus all this extra space, there was always just uh, an eeriness, like someone was looming in the shadows. If I had to get a drink in the middle of the night, for instance, I would always look at the ground the whole time because I was scared of what may be looking back at me from the dark corners, the rooms, and the hallway. Even the windows and the mirrors were avoided because I wasn't sure what I'd actually see looking back at me. Anyway, when I was around 12 years old, I questioned why the room that used to be my nursery was locked from the inside. I didn't think that it was weird before then. My dad needed a room for storage and all that, and I figured that he just wanted to keep me out or something. But I brought it up to him one day, asking what's so important in there that he needs to keep me out, even though I'm not a child anymore. A typical 12-year-old mentality, right? Turns out, though, that I was not entirely correct about the lock. My dad, with a very serious demeanor, sat me down and answered my inquiry. When I was a baby, maybe one or two years old, I slept in this nursery room on the second floor next to my dad's room. And this room was painted by my sister, especially for me, with Winnie the Pooh characters and fluffy clouds, the type of thing that I think back on and appreciate. The effort and the creativity was really admirable, I think. I have a photo of me smiling at Pooh Bear on the wall, actually, while we were setting it up. Anyway, I was in this nursery in my crib, again right next to my dad's room, 
the perfect age to be on my own. Every night, though, my dad was woken up by my scream crying. He had raised four children before me, so he was not making the first-time parent mistakes that would otherwise be in question. He thought that it was probably just the switch to me being in my own room rather than being in his room that caused my nightly discomfort. He considered bringing my crib back into his room, but of course the nursery was all ready to go. I mean, I had just graduated to my own big kid room. For a while when I cried in terror, he would come in and check on me, only to find that nothing was wrong in the sense of like present stresses like temperature, diaper change, hungry or thirsty, etc., he would stay with me until I fell asleep or keep the light on to make me feel safer and then return to his room to get some actual rest. One night though, after finally having enough of my distress, he decided to camp out on the floor of my nursery to see if he could figure out what the matter was, but mostly to try and sleep through the night too. And this was the last time that anyone ever slept in that room. So I was able to doze off now that I wasn't alone he, on the other hand, was tossing and turning on the hardwood floor, not comfortable enough to sleep, and as he laid there on the floor, mulling over the situation, there were three huge bangs that jolted him to his feet by a few massive blows to the floorboards beneath him, centered directly on his back, as if someone on the first floor was battering a ram aimed at the ceiling. His first instinct was to run downstairs and check for intruders, he's a man of logic after all, brave and ready to defend his family, However, when he got down there, the lights were off. There was no one downstairs. The front door was locked. Windows locked. No sign of forced entry. No one else lived with us. Our closest neighbor was down the road like a quarter mile, and why would they break in just to bang on the ceiling, let alone have mapped it out where my dad would be sleeping in my nursery that night? And the other thing was that the force of the blows... This wasn't normal blows... This actually moved the floorboards. After this event though, my dad brought my crib back into his bedroom and I was able to sleep without crying or screaming beyond needing a diaper change or something normal like that. He brought the Bible into the nursery for extra measure and casted out any evil that may have invited itself in there. He locked up that nursery and only used it for storage after that and only went in during the daytime. And to this day, that old lock is still on that door, as if a, a lock will keep spirits locked in, right? Short of pretending that experience never happened, he couldn't rationalize it enough to do anything else. But we think that the entity was evil and malicious, and when my dad tried protecting me, this only made it worse. As I grew up in that house, I had a really hard time sleeping in any room on my own, Many nights I ended up rushing to the couch in the living room, turning on the TV and watching Disney until I fell asleep again. But even then I was just not comfortable. There were always just what felt like eyes on me. There were many more unexplained events from that farmhouse, but this was the most direct encounter with evil that my dad has ever had. When I was in the 11th grade, I had this taxi driver who would drive me to school and drop me off at home every day. He seemed nice at first, and we always had some pretty good conversations. For the first few weeks, he was actually one of my favorite people. Just seemed like a cool guy in general. But then one day, things started to get a bit weird. He started telling me stories about what happens to girls on dark web videos and... I just stayed completely silent because, I mean, what the heck, right? Then he gave me a pair of his glasses, made me try them on and everything. Actually made me try on several pairs, I mean, and he even put his hand on my leg multiple times and actually had the audacity to give me his number at Facebook, completely without me prompting it. Let me just remind you all that at this time I was 17 and this dude was like in his 40s and had a wife and kids and everything. Along with that too, though, he kept begging me to let him teach me karate at his house. So, all of these things kept happening over the course of about a month. The tipping point, though, was when he actually sent me a message on Facebook telling me how beautiful I looked in a picture. I told my parents, which I should have done ages before that, and I blocked him. 
My parents proceeded to call the taxi company to report him. And the kicker is that this particular taxi service was specifically for minors going to school. But wait, there's more to this. So about a month goes by after that. I got a different driver who was actually much better and not creepy at all. Things were fine too until I walked out of school one day and the creepy taxi driver was right there in the parking lot in his car waiting for me. But because I didn't know that it was him, I went right up to the car to get in. Obviously when I saw his face, I stopped myself and said, Oh sorry, I forgot something and ran back into the school. He didn't look normal that day either. His eyes were red as if he'd been on drugs and his beard was completely full when he always kept it shaved. He kept making strange grunting noises in the few seconds that I was there too. My parents were obviously furious that he showed up like that and called the taxi company again. The manager of that company said that it was probably just an accident in their system but I don't believe them at all. I honestly feel like if I had gotten in that car that day that... I probably wouldn't be here. I'm 18 now, but from ages 3 to 11, my family and I lived in a large four-bedroom Victorian home. It wasn't really the location that you would expect a haunted house to be in. I mean, we were right next to the busy street, in a row of other houses. All very old though, but... The house had three floors, as the attic had been converted into two bedrooms, and a large walk-in storage cupboard that separated the two rooms. I lived with my three older half-siblings, and so it was very common for us to swap rooms every few months. I'd slept in every room by this point, my parents' room quite often as I was terrified every night, but more on that later. The large room opposite theirs, and the two attic rooms as well. Each one seemed to have its own different type of horrors or whatever it was, but for the first few years I was too terrified to sleep on my own as a kid. I barely slept actually, and when I did I suffered from terrible nightmares, so I would sleep in a camp bed in their room. That was where I had my first encounter with sleep paralysis too. I couldn't have been older than six I would guess, but I still remember it vividly. A small boy with a paper bag over his head seemed to emerge seemingly from the wall next to my mother's side of the bed and slowly but surely was walking around their bed towards me. I remember looking to my side and there was what I can only describe as a tall black stick figure, like one of those drawings who was looking like above me. I couldn't move, I was sweating profusely but I knew that I was awake. The next thing I knew, he was crouching down to me and the boy had reached the foot of my bed. It was at that moment that I managed to let out a scream, and I've never had anything as vivid as that again, but I'll never forget it. When I was seven or eight, I started wanting to have my own room. I did a lot of reading to distract myself from the fear and often would stay up till the early hours reading, too terrified to sleep, but waking up in the morning with my book still in my arms. I was given one of the attic rooms, and by that point, my older sister had the room opposite mine, but she had gone off to university, and so I was alone up there. I would never dare sleep without the light on, and to be honest, old habits never really die, as even now I still sleep with the light, unless I'm with my boyfriend, of course. Most nights would be me reading as long as I could until I just had to close my eyes. It was then, though, that the voices would always start up. Like, there was a couple arguing in the hall. On some of the worst nights, I swear that I could hear breathing coming from under my bed as well. It came to a point where I was just so scared that I had to have my dog and cat sleep in my room with me, but they couldn't settle either. My dog would just keep crying and my cat was constantly spooked. They hated being in there, so I had no choice but to remain alone in there. And the night terrors continued. I'd wake up and just couldn't stand to be in my room anymore, so I'd creep down to the second floor and sleep outside my parents' room. I don't know how I even functioned with so little sleep, to be honest, but that was just life. Most times I couldn't have sleepovers too, as my friends would complain of being scared and hearing things. 
My siblings had similar experiences, and when my sister had her friend over, often her friend would recount waking up in the night, and my sister was sitting up in bed, still asleep, but talking to the dark corner. My brother would have his own covers pulled off of him in the night, and my other sister recalled her toes being pinched while sleeping. Everyone had their own experiences in that house, even non-believers too. My dad recounted being locked out of the house from the outside when he went out to the garden one time, even though he was the only one home, seeing a dark shadow glide next to the door as he struggled to open it too. Sometimes I would be sitting outside my parents' room at like 3 in the morning and I would hear the cutlery drawer downstairs being shaken, the TV being turned on for a split second and then off again, even though everyone was asleep. I couldn't do anything in that house without the feeling of being watched too, if I was alone in that house, I would stay out in the garden the whole time. Even then, I felt extremely uneasy. I would just sit on my trampoline and feel like a pair of eyes were watching me from, like, the living room window that looked out into the garden. Our elderly neighbor told my father the backstory of the house one time when my dad would sometimes recount the strange occurrences going on in the house. And he told us that years before we moved in, there lived a, a very reclusive middle-aged woman known to be very cold and unwelcoming. She didn't leave often, only to go to work as a gym teacher. She was known to be sadistic and cruel to the children that she taught though, and he mentioned something extremely chilling, which was that she had confided in him once that she lived in fear of the house. She refused to go in the attic as it terrified her, she died several years before we moved, but one of the most chilling things was that once she passed, the house was completely renovated. The attics turned into rooms, as I mentioned. The flower beds Mrs. Evans had so much pride in were torn up and everything just changed. The work was mostly done by one guy who had been hired to do so by the local council who inherited the house as Mrs. Evans had no family to speak of. And just days after he'd finished up the renovation, his daughter died in a freak lightning accident. I personally have no idea if it's tied to this. It is terribly unfortunate either way, but the neighbor seemed to think that whatever was in that house certainly did not take kindly to it being changed and decided to take revenge. That is just hearsay, mind you, but it's a bit strange nevertheless. What I do believe, though, is that there were several entities in that house, including possibly Mrs. Evans herself, but the strongest residing in the attic for sure. I felt things up there that I have since never encountered anywhere ever again. A genuine feeling of just something evil, something that wants to hurt you. I can't even recall how many times people were seemingly pushed when going down the stairs from that attic too, or whenever my cat, who was usually the most lovely boy, was near those stairs, he would viciously attack you with no explanation for his outburst. The whole house had, like, its moments. It was in a sort of constant state of darkness and bitter cold, but the attic? I don't even have the words to describe what that was. We finally moved when I was 11, though, and... As if by magic, the nightmares just completely disappeared. I could finally sleep easy, and we've moved several times since then, in fact, and I've never encountered a house like that before. Honestly, I haven't had any paranormal experiences that I can think of since being in that house, but that's just fine with me, because it was enough for a lifetime, let me tell you. I do think that it will always be with me, though. Sometimes I'll have the most vivid dreams that I'm back there and I'm so glad to be there and almost as if it's calling me back or something. I have so many stories of just creepy things happening, so much so that something like this would take several hours to explain, but I think that this is more than enough to make me feel spooked recounting it all. For a little bit of background, I no longer live on the same property, but this particular house always gave me bad vibes, and I had a few very minor paranormal experiences I would shake off as coincidence or imagination, but I've always felt a connection to the paranormal, even as a kid, which, if this does well, I'll give you some more experiences of mine some other time. 
So, a few years ago in my old house, I had been struggling to sleep for a while, and on this particular night, I had been reading pretty late. I would say around 2am, and I needed to get up to go to the bathroom. My room was very small, basically a glorified walk-in closet, despite the house being quite large. It was on the second floor in a long hallway, so in order to get to the bathroom, I had to pass the stairwell, but I had no issues whilst going there. When I washed my hands though, I distinctly remember how cold the room was and that the water had a slight brown tinge to it, dirty even, and was running very well, but I didn't pay much mind to it, I suppose. I was living with my parents at the time, so I would get my dad to look at it in the morning. On my way back, just as I was passing the staircase, I then heard my mum call out to me from downstairs, saying, Harry, come downstairs, me and dad have a new laptop for you. Now, I have no idea why, but sheer dread just flooded my body. I started trembling as the temperature dropped suddenly, but I also started sweating. For some reason, the only thing running through my head was that that's not my mother, and if I go down there, I'm going to die. It wasn't that this voice sounded like my mother, it was my mother's voice, as if it had borrowed or something, I don't know, but I took off down the hall and into the bedroom like a child. I have no idea what would have happened to me if I went downstairs, but I'm glad that I didn't. I asked both my mother and my father about it a couple of days afterwards. I was afraid to even acknowledge that it happened, to be honest, and both denied it ever happening, and they gave me a very odd look of concern. It was one of the more intense experiences that I didn't initiate myself, but I'll be happy to share other experiences of mine, so just let me know if you want to hear more. I've also noticed a shadow man and shadow people flare that opens up a whole can of worms from my childhood that I shared with my mum, and it's crazy to see that it's actually so common here on the internet. But again, I'll leave that for another time. So I just want to say from the outset that I'm really not very good at sharing stories, but I decided to share my experience and I'm curious to see what you guys make of it. I'm not religious and up until this point, I didn't even believe in the paranormal. My rationale, as crazy as it sounds, is that because I hung two pairs of shoes on a shoe tree, I experienced two hauntings. So... Uh, I was 20 years old and recently entered the gay dating world. I was seeing this guy for a bit, introduced him to my best friend. My date suggested that we all go on a late night drive along the rich country estates and past a massive shoe tree. I recently had two pairs of worn shoes or boots that I didn't really need so I brought them along to add to the tree's collection. Despite my best friend's objections, I hung the two pairs of shoes. On the drive back to the city, my date Google searched the shoe tree at that intersection, and supposedly people hang shoes on the tree to commemorate a couple that were murdered at that intersection like a century ago. The next night, my date took me to the movies. We drove back to my house, and we were chatting in the car at the end of my driveway. He was telling me about work and stuff like that, when I noticed the port light sort of activate about 14 houses down the road. I noticed a figure in the driveway, they were tall and wore a white flowing sheet over their head with distinct long sleeves. I pointed out to my date and we both start getting a bit nervous as it seems to be staring right at us, unmoving. After a minute, the figure turns towards the porch light. The light goes out and the figure just disappears. Two houses closer to us though, the porch light activates again and we see the same figure standing on that porch, swaying back and forth. The light goes out and the figure disappears again, and again, two houses closer, the port light activates and the figure is standing in the driveway. At this point, we're obviously freaking out, and my date drives us away before it gets any closer. Eventually, I made it home, but I didn't get much sleep that night. The next day, my parents went out and I was loading up the laundry in the basement. I heard my dad's footsteps come back in the house on the main floor. I must have forgotten something, I thought. I heard him walk from the front door to the back door. 
back and forth sort of over and over again. As I go to check it out, I hear my dad climb the stairs to the top floor. I reach the main floor. The front door is still locked and my parents are gone and someone is in my house now. I don't know where the courage came from, but I ran up those stairs to confront whoever this was. And when I reached the top floor, it was just completely silent. There are five rooms upstairs, and the bathroom in front of me is the only room that I can see inside perfectly. I run inside the bathroom quickly and lock the door. And as soon as I do, the footsteps start up again from one end of the hall to the other slowly getting louder and shorter until they're stomping right outside the bathroom door. I yell leave me alone and as soon as I did that the stomping just ended. My parents arrive home a few minutes later and that was it. These are the only two experiences that I've ever had mind you and all I know is that I will never throw old shoes on a shoe tree ever again. The Trials of Frank Carson, a new LA Times true crime podcast from the reporter behind Dirty John and Detective Trap. A defense attorney in Stanislaw County, Frank Carson, was famously known for his caustic behavior towards authority as he relentlessly fought against a system he felt was broken. But everything changed when he became rapidly entangled in a mess of a murder, one that named him the prime suspect. In Turlock, California, a known small-time thief named Corey Kaufman is murdered, and the authorities accuse Frank Carson of orchestrating a complex plot to kill him. They portrayed Frank Carson as a lawyer who was capable of manipulating the law for his own brand of vigilante justice. Frank Carson claimed that he was being set up by the DA and the police as payback for thumbing his nose at them for years. And this is one of the elements of the podcast that I absolutely loved. It has a very raw sort of unfiltered flavor. Couple that with a genuinely nice flow and rhythm to the presentation of the case, and it really is a thought-provoking and enthralling story to listen to. This is the story behind one of the longest and most bizarre murder trials in US history, and one that will make you reevaluate what you think about our criminal justice system. Listen and subscribe now to The Trials of Frank Carson on latimes.com or listen and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So I work as a manager in a call center, more of a, an emergency care line. You know those pull cords and pendants that vulnerable elderly people have? Well, we're on the end of them. I've worked there for around two years and I've never had anything spooky or paranormal come through, despite dealing with death on a daily basis too. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that I would like to start by saying that I don't believe in the paranormal, nor am I religious and I'm still trying to rationalize the events that took place. And although I didn't see them firsthand, they still sent chills down my spine. So it was a Friday night, must have been around 9.30 as I had just come back from my break and I was the only supervisor on duty. I received a call from an operator, home working due to COVID, stating that they had received a call from a paramedic and that we had called out for an alarm activation in a property with no response and they wanted a supervisor to call back. We get it a lot too, people saying that they want to speak to a manager and it normally means someone wants to complain about something, so I just shrugged it off. The weird thing though is that when I asked the operator why they needed me specifically, she said that the paramedic wouldn't tell her, which was really strange. So I called them back on the number that they provided, thinking to myself which operator has screwed up now, as it must have been related to a mistake or something. When the paramedic answered, he sounded a little bit shaken up. Not specifically scared, just awkward and nervous, which was weird as, as of the thousands of calls that I'd had and taken from paramedics, they had always been just so confident. But he answered with, Hey, uh, sorry to have asked for you directly. I, I just know some people might get upset with uh, this kind of stuff. Now, to me, that is code for, I've just found a resident that has passed away and didn't want to upset an operator, so I got ready to take down the details of the deceased. He gave me the address of the emergency and confirmed what the call-out was for. 
I brought up the details in our system and we didn't have anyone listed in the property, which isn't uncommon. Maybe we hadn't been informed of the new tenant yet. The paramedic advised calmly but nervously that he had attended and no one was in there and that there was no problem. Which was weird because you know, why couldn't he just tell an operator that? Then he said that something weird had happened in the property. Something that he needed my help to explain as he could not find a logical conclusion. He said that he arrived at the property at the same time as the house manager, who we had also called out just after the paramedics. The property manager advised that it was weird that they'd been called out as the previous resident had passed away in the property over two months ago and after the property was gutted, no one had been in there. Anyway, they unlocked the door and they entered in. The air was musky and dry, which made sense as the place was empty. But as the paramedic called out to see if any help was required, the property manager stopped in the doorway, frozen still. The paramedic asked what was wrong, and he said that the last time that they were in this property, the couch or the lounge was in the middle, and now it was sideways up against the wall. A few moments passed, and he put it down to the residence next of kin moving it up to clear the area or something. The two ventured in, the paramedic calling out still, and after they headed down to the corridor to the kitchen, the paramedic froze still again. Because on the ceiling, there was one of the resident's pull cords spinning parallel to it rapidly, and then as he just watched and waited, the cord began to slow down, and as it did, it began to move away from the ceiling. He then took a step in, thinking that someone may need help and the cord spanned slowly to a stop, just dangling there as if it was never moving. Both men searched the property thoroughly, thinking that someone must be in there to make the cord spin that much, but no one could be found. They both met just outside the kitchen again and the property manager said that he had to go back as he had to go and make dinner, but the paramedic knew that the man was shaken and just wanted to leave the property. They both stood in the hallway, looking at the court for a few moments before leaving swiftly. When both men were outside, they tried to rationalize why this cord would be spinning like that, and also what caused it to call through to my call center. The property manager said that the next of kin of the resident had a pendant at their house, and so that may have triggered the activation. Although, they lived over like a hundred miles away. Over the phone, the paramedic asked me if this may have caused the call out, but I know that these devices have a range of around 300 meters max. It would be impossible for the device to have caused the call out from like a hundred miles away. So I asked if it could have been caused by the draft from the window or the door or the extractor fan or something. But he advised that the extractor fan was off and all the windows were sealed shut. Plus, there was very little wind that night, and due to the location of the kitchen, there was just no way that any breeze from the door would make it there. Now, I just want to reiterate that in his tone of voice, he sounded genuinely concerned and said that in his 11 years on the job that he had never, not once, seen anything like it. I'd only been working in the call center for two years at that point, and this was the first time something like this had come through to me. He said that it reminded him of watching one of those ghost hunter shows where the mystery can always be put down to the special effects, but he just couldn't explain what he had seen and it was making him really uncomfortable. He also let me know that he was going to call from his responder car just outside the property, but he got a strange feeling that something was watching him. So he drove a mile up the road before calling. Anyway... He said that uh, he would update our notes as there was no one in there and that he was going off to get himself a drink as it was the end of his shift anyway and he needed to forget what he had seen. I wished him a good rest of his night and just sort of sat there thinking what could have caused that pull cord to spin like that. Don't get me wrong though, I could easily put the activation of the alarm down to a simple system error. I mean, it happens all the time, but... But nothing could explain what he saw in that property. From my perspective, if a, a resident, a next of kin, or even property manager had advised me of the happenings in the apartment that night, I probably would have chalked it down to them just being a, a little crazy. 
but a paramedic who sounded genuinely terrified while telling the story on the phone, that one just didn't sit right with me. In the end, I, I don't know what caused the pull cord to spin like that, and I probably never will. I just hope that this is the first and the last time that I hear of something like this happening. I have to get this story off my chest as it's just so messed up and it still creeps me out to this day and it all came back to me tonight like it was yesterday. So my wife at the time and I used to visit her parents in a state up north about a four hour drive away. It was an old nice big house with rolling green hills in the backyard and big oak trees and we always stayed in the apartment above the garage but this trip they told us that they were renovating the apartment and they had to stay in one of the bedrooms. We usually stayed for a few days and so we had our luggage with us. I was putting our clothes in the dresser and I came across some pictures in the bottom drawer. My wife was downstairs with her parents but these pictures, to put it simply, just shocked me. I'm pretty sure that they were not meant to be found. Because there were pictures of my father-in-law inserting objects into my mother-in-law. Now, three things were really messed up about these pictures. One, these objects weren't standard play toys that most of us are used to. It was things like tennis rackets, the round end, a wine bottle in another, and I think uh, a stuffed animal and just some really other messed up stuff. Obviously, I really freaked out. I didn't look anymore, just quickly put them back into the drawer. But the second creepy thing about the pics were the smiles. Both of them, it was almost like they were, I don't know, like they had extended smiles. Like in the horror movies with like the girl's lips are cut on each side to make the smile wider. Or maybe that clown on the American Horror Story. Just really nutty smiles. Like, they were almost painted on their faces or something. Anyway, all I could think at the time was, what the heck did I just witness? Now, I know, like, no one was around when I was looking at them or standing in the doorway watching me. That adds relevance to what I'm about to tell you in a bit too, but... The third thing about the pics is that her dad was retired from a high-profile job and very conservative, and I could just never ever see him doing something like that, let alone her mum participating. Anyway, I walked downstairs freaking out a bit, but managed, with some alcohol, to have dinner with everyone and sort of save face. I remember everything was normal, like every other time we visited, and we went to bed later that night. But during the night, I was woken up by something that really freaked me out even more. You see, my mother-in-law was standing at our doorway just staring at me with that same messed up smile, now holding a wine bottle and a tennis racket. I just flipped right there, couldn't move, and I was paralyzed. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone, like in two seconds flat. The wife was sleeping, snoring actually, but it just seemed so real at the time but I must have been dreaming I wasn't drunk I know that but it's up for debate still in my head but if I had to stake my life on it she was there at that doorway I'm pretty confident obviously at the time I had all of these questions in my head like did she see me looking at the pictures that's too crazy it's too coincidental and I know all of them were downstairs at the time but how did she know Anyway, the next day I'm the last one up and I'm walking downstairs and my wife is really mad at me at breakfast. It was like she picked a fight with me just for no reason. I think it was about the supposed shoddy job I did on a building wall at their house the previous summer or something. And that was all just lies though and she knew it. They all knew it and even I knew it. I do very good work but... She just kept on about it and her parents just sat there kind of smiling away while we were arguing like it was nothing. I remember looking at all of them like 
What the heck is going on? It was like a, a big conspiracy. I mean, we never argued like that before, and even if I built that wall with cardboard, something like that would never have turned into the argument it did. I mean, we were all really laid-back people up until that point, and yeah, that would have been a, a joking kind of thing. But my wife was just on a different level that morning, and her parents were like twice as weird, just sitting there like they were. That freaked me out even more, too, and then the yelling act my wife was putting on... I, I was just so traumatized by then by the whole situation that I went upstairs and I packed my stuff and I just left the house. But with no objection from my wife or the in-laws, not a word then, and that was super weird too. I got in the car though and I ended up driving back home like four hours by myself, getting more and more creeped out with each mile, my anxiety building. Was it the pictures? Did mum manipulate the whole situation and cause her weird American horror story that night before? I don't know, but there was no phone call from my wife the whole way home. No nothing. I did leave a what the heck is wrong with you people today message on her parents' landline. But it was just 100% weird in that kitchen that morning. By the time that I got home too, I remember I was ready to leave my wife for sure and just never ever wanted to see my in-laws faces again. Even though I really liked them a lot before this and we got along really well. My wife did end up coming home a couple or a few days later I think. We made up on the phone and she apologized I think but I wasn't there by the time that she got home and long story short we just got divorced not long after that. She never really did explain why she jumped on me like that too that morning. But by then I truly just didn't care how much we invested in that marriage or how beautiful she was or how much I still loved her. I was just too creeped out and I knew things probably never would be the same again. At least in my head. I never did see my in-laws again or my ex-wife ever again too or ever tell her what I saw in the drawer that day or what I saw that night. It's been almost 20 years now and I guess it's uh, too late now for any answers, right? A few years ago I was 18 years old and heading home from a New Year's party at a friend's house. I had a habit of calling my mum to let her know that I was on my way but this night my phone ran out of battery. My friend and I stood at the subway platform when I noticed this older man, maybe in his 40s or 50s, taking pictures of us with his phone and staring quite intently. I kind of brushed it off as him just taking pictures of the crowd on the station and I just tried to ignore him. A few minutes later my train arrived so I said goodbye to my friend and turned on my mp3 player and grabbed a seat. But then the creepy older guy proceeded to sit down next to me and started trying to make conversation. It started off innocently enough, but quickly resulted in him complimenting my appearance, asking me where I live, or where I'm getting off, etc, etc, in a quite aggressive manner too. He was also texting someone with his phone all throughout it, and I noticed too that his teeth were filed to be more pointy. I'm not talking about just regularly uneven teeth too, but full-on Christopher Walken in Sleepy Hollow type dentistry work. The more I made it obvious to him too that I was uncomfortable and telling him to stop talking to me, the more aggressive he got and eventually he just told me that I'm going to come home with you. You can try to call the police. It won't matter. I'm coming home with you. I looked around the crowded train and even though everyone was clearly overhearing this, they just merely rolled their eyes and smiled a bit as if it was some sort of innocuous relationship banter. I held my dead phone in my hand and started thinking about escape routes from the train station to my home, when suddenly the woman opposite me started kicking my leg. At first I thought I was surrounded by crazies, but as the train stopped, several stations before mine, she got up, took me by my arm and pulled me off the train. Creepy man tried to follow, but the woman kind of pushed him back and the doors closed before he had time to get off. The woman then walked me to a bus that would get me home and told me how she'd been a victim to similar men in the past and she wouldn't let it happen to somebody else. 
But I'll never forget how a, a train filled with adults around my parents' age were simply smiling and ignoring my blatant discomfort and potential danger for a good 10 minutes at least. And I will forever be grateful for the woman who finally stepped in and helped me. I do wish that there were more people like her out there. At the time that this happened, I was 17 years old. I had been living for a few years in a small house with my mum after my parents divorced six years ago. The house wasn't huge, but we had one floor with our bedrooms and a small garden. We also have a dog who isn't really that scary. He's just uh, one of those small dogs with like uh, a lot of hair. His biggest default is that he barks a lot during the day every time somebody is close to the garden. That annoyed me too and my neighbours a lot as well but it's important to recognise that my dogs never bark at night and always sleep in my bed with me. Anyway, one night in the middle of the night I had a dream where I heard a constant dog barking and in my dream I felt like it lasted for a thousand years but... I think it only lasted for maybe a few seconds, because when I woke up from that nightmare, I didn't feel the weight of my dog on my feet. I felt like something was wrong too, and then realized that my dog was actually barking and growling. I didn't understand what was happening, I just looked for my dog and saw him on the top of the stairs. His head sort of turned towards the front door. The door opening to the garage was actually on the side of the front door. I jumped out of my bed and I rushed to the top of the stairs where my dog was. And there was this shadow of a man standing just at the bottom of the stairs next to the front door. I wasn't even able to shout. I just took my dog in my arms by reflex and ran towards my mum's room. My mum had just woken up. She takes medication to sleep so it's actually pretty hard to wake her up. But thank God that she did. And the door of her bedroom thankfully can be locked with a key too. Even though I was shaking like I never had, I still managed to lock the door. My mum understood immediately what was happening when we heard the footsteps coming up from the stairs. We froze in the corner of her bedroom and she grabbed her phone to call the cops. While we were trying to reach the cops too, the guy started shaking the door handle and then punching the door. After a moment he stopped and this psycho just laughed at us. That's when my mum came up with a great idea of shouting, I called the police, get out. After a moment, we heard him going down the stairs, still laughing. We didn't dare move until we heard the police officers come through the door, but when they arrived, nobody was there. But in the living room on the table, there was a note that apparently he must have written. And it said, see you soon. He said later that apparently the guy got in and out by my garage, which has a back door that at that time we always left opened. Immediately after that though, we went to live with my grandparents for a while and moved out into a new house a couple of months later. We never did hear from this guy again, but we always check every door is locked before going to bed these days and I also have a bit of trouble sleeping ever since then. In fact, for almost a year after that, I would always wait until it was about 4am to go to sleep, just to be sure that he didn't find us and try to sneak into our home again. When my son was six years old, we moved into a house where the elderly lady named Millie had unfortunately died. It was right next to my friend's house and they were having trouble renting it because everybody knew someone had died in this house. We were pretty much just starving students though so we jumped at the chance to live in the house for cheap. Also, we weren't believers in ghosts or anything so it wasn't like it was a problem. The house was nice and with a screen in porch and large yard. And one morning, two months after moving in, I found my six-year-old son in his four-year-old brother's room. The six-year-old never slept with the four-year-old, but I went into his room and I found that he had moved a, a rocking chair, his toy box, and his clothes hamper up against his closet door. I asked him why he did this. The six-year-old's room was directly across from the bathroom, and apparently he got up in the middle of the night and was sitting on the toilet when he saw a glow coming from down the hall. 
and he said that uh, an old lady with a candle stopped at the bathroom door and looked at him. She then turned into his bedroom and went into his closet where she soon just disappeared. We didn't really know what Millie looked like so I asked him to describe her. I wasn't sure if it was just his imagination but he was truly terrified even if it was just a dream. He said that she was very short with white hair. She had on a, a blue robe of some sort. He said the robe had lines on it, but he didn't think that they were printed, but he still thought that he saw lines on the robe. He was kind of obsessed with the lines and being six, he was having trouble describing it. But I went next door and asked my friend how tall Millie was. Oh, real short, she said. Maybe 4'7"? And my hair started standing up then. So I said, do you know what color robe she had? And she said... Millie had a blue chenille robe, I think, that she wore pretty much every day. And at that, I really freaked out then because I realized that it was chenille fabric that he was trying to describe for the lines on the robe. And a six-year-old, at least mine, there's just no way that they would know what this fabric was. I first thought that maybe the neighbor kids had told him about the old lady dying and it was just his imagination... But the thing with the robe was just disturbing. I mean, I couldn't imagine kids going into that kind of detail for just a, a prank. A few months later we moved though because my son just couldn't settle down and kept mentioning seeing this old lady. After hearing the story, his pediatrician told me, Don't you dare tell this child that he did not see a ghost. I don't want him to think that he's crazy and how dare we assume that we know everything that there is to know in this universe. And to be honest, I thought the pediatrician was pretty wise, in fact. And I must admit that he made me a bit of a believer. So I went out to eat with a couple of friends, one of whom was up from out of state to visit. We turned off this highway onto an exit. And right around the corner, just out of sight after the turn, a white car is parked mostly in the road with the door open. There's no hazards on and the guy is just sitting there in the car. I got a horrible and instant realization too that it looked intentional and not a problem with this car. And so I yelled at her to reverse immediately. But then the guy gets out of his car, fist clenched, eyes bugged out of his head, stumbling and taking very strange sort of jerky steps directly towards us. She froze and started shaking and I had to scream at her to reverse, even though cars are piling up behind us. I told her to let the cars go in front of us, to keep backing up slowly and he ignores the other vehicles, still staring at the two girls in the front seat, just beelining right for us. We managed to pull up as the other vehicles are also trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And he seemed to get sort of confused by the moment of cars passing him now and turns around and starts heading back to his vehicle. But I am positive that it was to grab some sort of a weapon or a gun or something. We managed to squeeze around and accelerate past him and she's sobbing now. I turn around and sure enough, he had something in his hand but... It was a little too far to see exactly what it was and we were now out of distance so he couldn't really reach us. But I am absolutely certain that this guy was on heavy drugs and alcohol and was having some sort of a psychotic breakdown from the looks of him. He wasn't asking for help, he wasn't trying to rob anyone, this guy just blocked traffic on a highway with the intention of probably murdering the first person that he was able to block in. I only just got home from this too and I still have a lot of adrenaline rushing even now thinking about it but I think I just need to try and calm myself down. 